content. It works. It does. And you can have like a therapy session. We just spent 30 minutes and you were like on the couch and that's real. And I'm not trying yeah, to make light no, of no. it. No, it's no, good of stuff. Course. Well, I can't always be an idiot. No, you can't. There's two in a row that you've got pretty know, deep. This is deepness. Deepness or darkness or both. Darkness is not always bad. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be deep. True. Yeah. Yeah. It took us 17 episodes, 16 episodes. Oh, we're on like just 19 Just farting now. around. Yeah. Just finding our way. finally get in. It's like, yeah. all of a sudden, now we're going to really start saving the metaverse. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Saviors of the Metaverse, the podcast that saves and definitely entertains. You're listening to the show on a related yet unrelated podcast. To get all the episodes of Saviors and to become a Saviors super fan, search for Saviors of the Metaverse on your podcast player of choice. Once there, I don't know, subscribe. And while you're at it, give it a rating because, well, Jared needs confirmation. Jared needs affirmation. Jared needs Savior Nation. And if nothing else, thank you for listening to Saviors of the Metaverse. We'll see you in there. Can you read? Um, We're going to find out. Do I have to? Yeah. Your teachers used to call on you to read and people would like, you start sweating. Yeah. <laughs> I was always good at reading. Math, not so good. Okay. Math today, still not so good. Mm -hmm. Reading, really great. I just choose not to do it very often. Yeah. That's my story. Yeah. So this one comes from my my buddy Dave. Dave spent time in the Army, 20 years, I believe. No, 18 years. I sent him the last episode, and he said, it felt Vonnegut Tarantino, for whom the bell tolls, ish. It's a lot of dashes in there. Yeah. He said, seriously, though, whimsical with an underlying culturally relevant seriousness, unstructured dialogue that weaves back to a central point, and the crux of the conversation manifests at the very end. It's cool. And to me, I think, I'm really glad that he took away that from our show. Yeah. Because you and I can attest to the fact that we don't plan it like that. No. I'd like to say we're accidentally ingenious, mm. but with dashes in between all of those words. Yeah. That's accidental like is good, though. Yeah, so here's a shout out to my buddy Dave Franklin. For sure. Yep. Thank you for your service. Oh, God. God. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen. Why? You can't say that. I'm going to explain something to you. It's a joke in the military. Now, I didn't serve as a soldier, but oh. I grew up in the Army okay. my whole life. I thought you were going to tell a story about how you just like inserted yourself in the Oh, no, no, no. I will always combat. find a way to make it about me. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Mm -hmm. I'll be one of those guys. Yeah, you know, I've never actually served in yeah. combat, but if I did, I'd probably be decorated. Fucking <laughs> ridiculousness. No, but in the Army, it's kind of a joke. So if you grew up in the Army as an Army brat, which I did, or if you served in the military, it's kind of a joke. Like with my buddies down at Fort Bragg, we it's a very sarcastic joke. We thank each other for, well, nobody thanks me, but I thank them for their service all the time. And yeah. it always turns into a, you know, much of a joke only because it's like, I don't know. It kind of plays in this fact that on a high level and a little bit more of a serious note here, our country loves to send guys to war and then just fucking hates to take care of them when they come back. Yeah. Ooh. So the whole thank you for your service is usually just a bunch of smoke up the ass. Mm. It doesn't mean anything. Is that how they take it? Does it depend? Here's the thing with soldiers, and I'll speak specifically with special operations. Those are the guys that I spend most of my time with. Yeah. And, and I mean, conventional forces guys, probably the same too, but they don't care that much. They don't really have expectations of, hey, well, do you really mean it? I mean, they're not walking around going, you know, that kind of hurts my feelings. That's not who these guys are. Yeah. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. They're emotionally fucked up, <laughs> but they bury that shit deep down inside. So yeah. they're good. Yeah. No, but they'll tell you the same thing. It's just kind of a joke. Like, thank you for your service. They're good guys. I mean, so if somebody's being sincere, they can tell. Like, hey, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. But for us, I guess it's just more of a joke because it's usually You're on the inside. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Army's my home. That's what I grew up in. Mm. Moved around my whole life with them. I mean, that's all I knew. It's also why I never joined. I was like, no. I grew up around enlisted guys. And I was like, no fucking way. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't until I was about 21 that I got interested in the military, and that was in special operations. But then my wife and her great wisdom, I don't know, maybe I've talked about this in this podcast, three times in our 17 years of marriage, and this is while business has been going good, three times she has very clearly intervened to say, because I started considering the uh, what's called the 18 X-ray program, and it's basically where a civilian off the street can join the army 
and be guaranteed that they can go to assessment and selection. Does not mean they get selected. So if you want to be a Green Beret, you have to go through a rigorous process. Sure. Be assessed, be selected, you know, go through this this whole thing. But if you don't make it, you belong to Uncle Sam for four years. So I've always felt the draw to that community. I mean, you know, for well over 20 years. And I think it's just because of the, the mental wiring. I love those guys. I spent a lot of time down there working with a lot of those guys. They're like family. Yeah, so she stopped me from enlisting into that program three different times in our marriage. But, you know, since I'm kind of on this train of thought here, for me, everybody has, most of the time, if you feel a pull or a calling towards something, you go towards that. Or it's even if you try to block it out or if it's been lasting for 20 some odd years and, you know, shows up here and there, I think some good advice on that is maybe listen to it. Uh, what I've at least concluded, the story that I tell myself, what I believe that pull towards that community is, is that I felt a calling to serve those guys, not as their teammate in combat, but as their teammate in their second half of life. Mm. So the guys that I spend time with are in transition. Right. Uh, getting ready to leave. Guys that have been in 15, 20, 25 years. Yeah, they're just like family. Well, that's what you were saying about when they come back. Do people really take care of them? Fuck do they no. care? No, right. But that's yeah. where there's some people that do. Obviously, you do. Well, yeah. I mean, that's a complex I get it. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a whole conversation when you look at, again, athletics and military is very different, but there's a lot of talk in the NFL, which mm-hmm. is a contact sport. And what had happened to DeMar Hamlin, a lot of people were outspoken about players that can't play anymore. Right. The disability policy in with the NFL. Oh, that'd be an interesting thing to look at. That they're like, they've been fighting that for years. It was actually bad before, but it got worse. You're guaranteed to have a disability after playing for the NFL. Yeah. And a lot of these players from, say, the 70s, 80s, 90s built the league to what it is today. Yeah. And yet a lot of these players aren't getting compensated fairly when you had, and then they look and like, well, there's players making $20 million a year playing the sport that was built on their blood, sweat, and tears, let's yeah. say, and their injuries and their disability that they have now, let's say. So you hear about it a lot with military, with professional athletes, especially, you know, the amount of money the government or a professional league might have. I was listening to something that was a little bit different, but you know, Wounded Warriors mm-hmm. was yeah. a foundation and a lot of people speak highly of it. And then they have their own scandal, right? And they had a whole fallout. I don't know if you knew that. So that was like in 2016 where the leaders got Wounded Warriors project. I pulled it up because when you started talking about it, yeah. it triggered me to think about that. Top execs fired amid lavish spending scandal. You know, mm-hmm. so it's like you hear about these charities, like are they doing a good thing and they're not. And it sounds like a few years later, they started getting back on track. So I don't know where it stands today, but they're widely considered to be not the best. Yeah. Again, I don't know. I'm not in the inner workings of it, but it's like to your point of like professional football players, ex-military veterans, are they taken advantage of by the system? And that's so frustrating, right? Because they're like, well, nobody gives a shit about us. We come back. They all thank you for your service, right? All That's tough, right? right? It's a lot. There's a lot in all that. Thank you for your service. God forbid I have to spend money to take care of you, but thank you for your service. Right. (laughs) Yeah. It's pretty ridiculous. I mean, Well, does that fit into the narrative of like, we want, I think maybe it doesn't, but you can connect it for sure. us. Sure, I'll try. You've heard the not in my backyard, right? So like, yeah. we want to get public housing. We want this, we want that. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden we're like, okay, cool. We'll, we'll build it right here. We're like, no, 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 no. That, that's way too close to where I live. Yeah. Like, I don't understand. Like, yeah. Well, you know, that's... Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the lip service. Mm. The problem with lip service. Virtue signaling. Yeah. You know, we want to say the right things. But when it actually comes to something that is going to cost you something, even if it's not directly, but if it's taxpayer money, whatever it might be. Yeah. Or in the housing example, it's that affordable housing is going to go up in your backyard, right? Well, then that's where true colors come out. Now, that's not saying that every affordable housing scheme is, scheme is not the right word, but every affordable housing proposal is always good. It, a lot of times it's not. Right. Like we've got one that's been, you know, close to by where we live. And a lot of people have been fighting it for a long time, but I'm pretty sure it's going to pass and it's going to go through. Well, the big argument they've been making is that you don't have public transportation that stops in the vicinity. Mm. You don't have walkable access to grocery stores and other things. Like This is all that's required for an affordable housing community to be successful. You're putting them potentially in a position where they still have to rely on services that are not being provided. 
But because some legislator really wants to push because we're for affordable housing, they found a plot of land, they bought it up and go, we're going to do it right here. Right. But they haven't thought through all the additional things that need to go into play to make that a successful community. Because that's not what they're concerned with. They're yeah. concerned with, hey, vote for me. We stand for this. And if you're against this, then yeah. you're an elitist asshole. But I mean, that's how that game is played. Yeah. Same thing happens with the military and even with veterans care. Yeah. I didn't know about that with wounded warriors, but you'll find that anytime there's billions of dollars in play and you've got multiple organizations that are providing services, there's going to be fraud. Absolutely is. There's going to be waste. And sadly, a lot of that fraud and waste, it's not like you fraudulently benefited a soldier. It's going to be, you know, the fraud was that you lined your pockets. And by the time the money and the, you know, the funding made it down to actually providing services for veterans, it was either gone or nothing had really changed. So sadly, that's the system. Yeah. People love to talk a big game. But then when you actually get down and say, well, how is it directly impacting the people you say you're here to serve? Well, that's where the truth comes out. Yeah. You know, like the organization that I've, you know, worked with and helped to get off the ground was the Dunham and Bank Foundation that Paul Tulin, a retired Lieutenant Colonel, Green Beret, 35 years. And in the Janus program that another guy drew stamp, he's still active duty. These guys, like the mission of this organization, and when we work together to really pull this thing together, was to say, what is the, what's our mission here? What is the thing that we're trying to accomplish? And the mission statement for this really encompasses the whole idea of why this organization exists. And that is to help special operators bring closure to their warrior story and transition to a life of peace, contentment, and balance. Everything in that statement is deliberate. Because one of the biggest problems that these guys have, especially after a full career in the Army, an extraordinary community, is that when their time is up, the Army pretty much is just like, thanks, don't let the door hit you on the way out. We've got four guys to replace you already. Oh. And, you know, so for a lot of these guys, everything that is given the meaning and purpose, because that's one thing in my own outside observation of the special operations community, and I can speak only about the army, but I imagine it's the same in some of the other uh, branches as well, is that it creates an environment for a particular type of person. This is also why there's a kinship that I have with these guys. I think it's because the way our brains are wired is that I've never lived in an environment or been able to work in an environment that allows me to operate at my highest level. This is why I work for myself too. I've had to contain that shit because most people like kind of work much more in a bureaucratic structure or, you know, I don't have a lot of time for bullshit or politicking. For me, it's like, hey, what is it we're trying to get done? Okay, let's go do that. Doesn't mean we don't think. It just means, do we really have to play this game so everybody feels good? Like, let's get the job done and we still take care of the team yeah. together. But that doesn't really work in the modern day working environment. There's just a lot more. I don't know. We could go on and on yeah. about that. Point is, though, is that these guys are given an environment where they can excel, where they are uniquely wired in a certain way. I guarantee a lot of them are attention deficit, <laughs> just like me. You know, you'd be amazed at the number of guys that work in this. And when I say guys, I'm referring to guys and gals but a number of the soldiers that are in special operations that are very artistic. They're musicians. They're very creative. I mean, that's part of what makes them effective operators is that they are creative problem solvers. Now, that becomes kind of a cliche and a joke, like, well, I'm a creative problem solver. But they really are. They have to be. So conventional forces, and again, generally speaking, you wait until you're told what to do before you take action. Special operations is you take action because you would know what the end objective is. You're not waiting around for somebody else to tell you what to do. You find creative ways to get it done. And if there's a problem, you just apologize for it in the, on the back end. You know, now that's an oversimplification. I mean that in the sense that these guys are very action-oriented. They have a bias towards action. I'm wired that same way, which can often make it difficult to work in very bureaucratic environments. Yeah. Frustrating. Yeah. Right. It's very frustrating. But all that said, yeah. and this because I'll lose my train of thought here, is that after 18, 20 years in that kind of environment, where you have purpose, you have meaning, like your whole life and identity is wrapped up in that, then you're out on the street. And I don't mean homeless. I mean, I get you're a civilian. That's a real shock to the system. Real shock to the system. 
transitioning from being a warrior, especially over the past 20, 25 years, these are combat vets, multiple deployments, getting out, being a civilian, not being in that environment anymore, fucks a lot of them up. Yeah. Because there's not a real clear pathway for transition. Yeah. There's plenty of programs that are out there to help these guys get jobs and they can get jobs. But there's very little, if anything, other than the Donovan and Bank Foundation that is actively trying to help these guys get centered on their purpose, you know, rewrite their story. That whole idea of bringing closure to the warrior story, transitioning to a life of peace, contentment, and balance, very selective words. These are things that most guys, when they get out, don't have peace, contentment, and balance. This is why you see a lot of guys that just, and you'll see this in the conventional forces too, the number of of veterans that live around military bases. Now, some of that's for convenience Mm -hmm. because they can still get on base, go to the PX. All those things are just basic convenience things. But the reality is, is that it's also, it's the community that they know, they love, and that's their entire identity was wrapped up in it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to leave it. Yeah. So that creates a lot of depression, a lot of substance abuse. Plus, if, you know, these guys didn't have anybody helping them through the disability process on the way out, the way it is, is if you didn't file this stuff or get it recorded before you get out of the army, the VA isn't going to fucking do anything Mm. to help you with anything that wasn't documented before you got out. Oh. Like proven the pre-existing condition. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's great organizations that help to do that too. One called Task Force Dagger. My buddy Jeff Dardia, he's still active duty. He's been really running that one hard. And it's to make sure, I've watched him give his presentation on making sure they've got all of these things in line. He's like, look, everything needs to be documented. And again, you're dealing with special operators. So they'll fall down and break a wrist and be like, ah, fuck it. It's no big deal. It's like, no, no, it's a big deal. You may be bulletproof now. No pun intended on that. It's just, you may be, you know, because your adrenaline is always so high, but something happens when you get out of that environment and you transition and you're now a civilian, all of these injuries that maybe you could just push right through because you were in that environment and just, mm. you know, no big deal. They all kind of come home right at the same time. Yeah. You see that story over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And then there they are. They're like, holy shit. I need an elbow replacement. I need a knee replacement. All the cartilage is gone from multiple jumps. I mean, God, it's just VA is not going to pay for that. No. Wasn't documented. Yeah. Get it documented. Well, you have all these people out here who, like you said before, they pretend they know what's happening, right? Sure. And we, maybe civilians, have expectations that this will be taken care of. It's like, they don't, right? It's like, yeah. the expectations just are so low. Well, because you would think, <laughs> right. you would think if the government, if politicians, bipartisan politicians would do anything, it would be to take care of the veterans. Yeah. And they don't. But that doesn't help them right now. What helps them now is taking care of those people that are active duty, like you said. Well, yeah. And not to say that's the benefit because like long-term, like we were talking about before in sports, it's like, well, that's not making them more money. No. Like, yeah, you get bad press, and but you just blow past that. Yeah. And they, for all intents and purposes, and it would, obviously it would be better. I'm speaking as an observer, as an army brat, as right. a kid who grew up with a dad in the military and deployed and moved on multiple army bases. That's, you know, the army will always be my family. And then the guys down at Bragg and the folks I spend time with down there, they're my family. I love those guys. But I'm still, like, I was never a soldier who deployed in combat. I was never a soldier in that sense. So I can only speak as a third party, you know, in certain things. But I understand that community enough because I grew up in it and because I spent a lot of time with these guys of just what it does. And yeah, when you're in, I mean, you got access to everything. It's Mm -hmm. great. Because that's the system, the way it's designed is set up. The system runs pretty well because it's been running for a long time. What doesn't work is when guys get out. And again, that's the nature of the beast. Yeah. It'd be really good to have Paul Tulin on here to talk about this. Yeah. Because I mean, he'll break it down and tell you, you know, exactly how this stuff works. But that's the thing. You would think that we're doing a good job of taking care of veterans. Yeah. And a lot of times it's the other veterans taking care of veterans, right? Like there's the individual, he's a high up bank executive for regional bank in the Southeast. Mm -hmm. And when he's talking to people and looking to hire people, he's always wanting to bring in those who had served. Oh, man. Because they fit the sit we've talked a lot about with him, decision making. Yeah. Right. No compromise. Yeah. Not having all the information going back to decision making. And he is actively looking for people along, you know, who fit, like who have a background. You know, he's an army combat veteran. Yeah. And so he'll help out. Are you connected to this guy? Yes. I mean, because seriously, I could get him connected. Absolutely. We would want to have folks like that. Yeah. Get him connected with the foundation. Yep. 
because I'd tell you this, if I start hiring at some point, I plan to do it. My first pick is transitioning Green Berets, man. Yeah. I mean, those are my guys. I love them. And the thing I love about them is that, you know, if you tell them, you know, you're clear and like, hey, this is the objective, you don't have to go check on them to find out if they're getting it done. Right. That's the difference. Yeah. They do what they say they're going to do and they say what they mean. Yeah. Two incredibly important qualities in a teammate and in a leader. Yeah. And you do not find that in the civilian world. You don't find that in the military oftentimes, but in that community, it's high value. If you don't live up to that, you're kind of blackballed as a piece of shit. Right. And that's such a tight knit group that mm. upward mobility kind of gets slapped down. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting time to be having this conversation because so much of what we've talked about during COVID, post COVID, is mental health. Oh, yeah. Right. In those transitions. And you hear yeah. about people transitioning. There's all sorts of transitions in life, but probably maybe none bigger or at least like leaving the military, right? Not being active duty, going into civilian life. Like that's got to be. It's a big one. Yeah. It would be a big one. I mean, yeah. I remember watching my mom and dad when they left after 26 years. Yeah. That was a pretty big adjustment. Yeah. My dad does a good job of just slamming it all inside, oh, and sure. compartmentalizing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a Nichols. Right. And we're Scottish. Yeah. That's part of the family tradition. Take your emotions, stuff them down deep, <laughs> yeah. and they'll explode every now and then. Yeah. But you're good. Yeah. Yeah. So he compartmentalized, but my mom had a real hard time. Yeah. So the transition isn't just on the, the soldier. Oh, sure. The whole family. There's a common inside the military community. You know, I remember my dad deployed in the first Gulf War. I was in sixth grade. What's interesting, I say that was tough, but that's only because as recently I had to start reflecting on that. But if you had asked me before, I'd be like, yeah, I really don't remember a lot of that time period. It's not because when you're sixth grade, you don't remember. It's you remember everything. Yeah. It's because, again, you learn to compartmentalize as an army kid. You just do. When you're moving every six months to three years, you just kind of compartmentalize. It's a desert storm. Well, not because of Desert Storm. That's just the but army that's life. what you're talking about, that yeah, time period. Yeah, I was in Desert Storm. Yeah. And again, I say, hey, I'm really blessed because my dad came home. And because Desert Storm was so short. Right. What these guys have had to do over the last 25 years, man, holy shit. Yeah. I mean, that's really been something. I've watched the Army families over the last 20 years and just thought, man, I cannot imagine my father deploying multiple times in these environments. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I mean, the resilience that has to come out of that as an Army family. If you, maybe, yeah. Yeah, oh, but no, a lot of pain <clears throat> comes out of that too. Yeah. Even when guys come home. Hmm. There's perspective in all of that because when you talk about your dad mm -hmm. going away when you're in sixth grade, so we're around the same yeah, area, yeah. right? I remember where I was that night when oh, yeah. they announced it. So I was out to dinner with my parents, with my dad and my yeah. mom. I think my brother might've been in college. I can't remember. Maybe not. We were going to go to a hockey game that night. Buffalo Sabres were playing. I could just remember because we always went to this you restaurant, Santa Cerro's in Buffalo, and they announced it. And we decided not to go to the game. My dad didn't feel it was right. But I was with my dad mm -hmm. when they, like, it was on the news and basically we're going to war. Right. It's just, it's perspective. It's like having that understanding, like, like now knowing you all these years later, mm -hmm. your dad was off. Yeah. You know, it's just wild. And when you think about it, like, I remember where I was. I mean, obviously, when he deployed, we were in uh, El Paso, Texas, Fort Bliss. Dad was with the 3rd Armored Cavalry, so he was with the tank division. And those guys were, you know, the first to cross the line because that was, you know, it was a ground war. But we, I mean, obviously, I remember we were all in the airfield watching them. So they would stage at one of the big hangars. We all got to say goodbye. And then we'd watch them get up on their plane. And then we would just stand there waving to them, you know, and they taxi, and then they take off. And then uh, nine months later, we're there again when they came home. But I remember where I was when oh, we were watching the news. We were in Ohio at my grandparents' place. They had a farm. And we were all inside, and the news was on. And I remember my dad, my uncle, he was a former Green Beret in Vietnam, so military service. And then my grandfather, who was a Marine during World War II, and my dad were all standing around the TV. And the nightly news was about Iraq, you know, had invaded Kuwait. And, you know, some other things. I just remember that was the first moment we kind of saw there. And I remember overhearing my dad and my grandpa and my uncle talking. And it was just kind of like, we're going to go. We're going to be there. And it was like a real shift in the energy. It's like dad already knew. And I'm sure dad already knew because it's not like that was the night that Iraq invaded Kuwait. They had already done that. But as things were ratcheting it up and, you know, President Bush Sr. at that time was talking about the need to intervene, 
dead obviously being active duty at that time was in conversations knowing that they were going to be one of the first groups to go and that was kind of the okay i guess we should discuss this with the family i remember wow. that wow yeah yeah and that was that was just a weird thing to try and process you know in fifth sixth grade yeah which is interesting because it's me and my sixth grader <laughs> right now i was just talking to my wife about this he and i butt heads but partially because I mean, he's in sixth grade, so he's got a lot of hormones going. He's an early bloomer. Kids already got a mustache. <laughs> I'm like, man, what? So he's getting so big. <laughs> so, you know, so some of it's hormonal. And then the other part of it, too, is, and I just had to explain to my wife, I said, part of our, our headbutting is also like his father. I do believe that one of his primary love languages is conflict. Now, that doesn't mean getting into fights, it means that a way that we find people quickly that we can trust. And who we will always have their back is people that will push back on strong personalities, right? So if I get into debate with you, it's not because I want to dominate you, right? It's because, you know, in a way, it's like, I want you to, to wrestle with me. Like, I can't trust you if you don't fight back. Does that sound weird? Yeah, I got you. It's like, if you cower or just like, ah, or play a victim, it's like, oh, well, and this sounds all fucked up, but I think subconsciously, like, well, you're kind of like dead weight. You know, yeah. it's like, I want you to fight. Tell me I'm wrong. Yeah. Like this isn't about being right for me. It's, I want to know I can trust you because if you fight me, I know I can trust you. Yeah. And you can't do that with everybody though. God, no. Right. Which just also goes back to why, you know, the special operations guys that I work with, I'm like, they feel like family because we think and process information yeah. in a very similar way. Like that's, that's one of the wonderful things is being able to work with these guys is I know how their brains work. Yeah. So I can look at them. I can see the look on their faces. They're trying to go through all this stuff to transition. I'm like, hey. I got it. Let me help you understand what's happening. Mm. I'm really happy that I can be in that position to do that. But that is part of the reasons too why it's, you know, not working for anybody else is because that can get misinterpreted oftentimes. My intention is, hey, I want you to fight me because if you fight back, <laughs> it sounds so, there's got to be better ways to put this. If you fight back, you know, my respect for you goes up greatly just because I'm like, good, this person knows themselves enough that they're not going to tolerate my bullshit. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah. Because you got a lot of it. Well, sure. Yeah. But I'm very much aware of it too. Right. So it also shows me that I won't have to worry about you holding a grudge for nine months and then exploding nine months later and getting all mad and like all this, like a laundry list of things that had upset you. I've had that happen. You've talked me. about that before. Yeah. And then I was like, can't trust that person. Yeah. You would have rather that person just said, I'm done with Jared. Or out, I would have right. rather that person say, hey, man. I'm saying if they didn't come back to you at the time, because like I said before, I don't, you can't do that with everybody. No, you no, can't. No. That's a high expectation or it's a, maybe they're just like, I'm done with him. Right? For sure. Yeah. Which is showing conviction in its own way and being like, for sure. Deuces, Absolutely. Right? I'm, out. I'm yeah. like, hey, totally cool. Yeah. I keep my expectations I'm sure you've very done. low. Yes. Not with well, me. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I get along with most people. Now, if there's somebody I just dislike, and mm -hmm. I mean by dislike is, and again, this is part of the luxury of working for yourself is I don't have to be around people I don't want to be around. Right. A lot of people don't have that option. They have to go to an office yeah. where they're around people they don't like. Yeah. So they have a whole skill set they have to develop about dealing with those people. Not me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. But you could have clients, and I've dealt with this before, mm -hmm. where you have a certain client and they're important maybe because of the revenue they help generate, the introductions, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. And they create, and I'm, maybe I'm talking about specific situation, yeah. and they create this level of stress and you need it for a while until you realize that to your point, you don't need it. Man, I'll tell you. So in the work that I do now, so over the last 12 years in advising as a futurist, consulting, teaching, I have not had that kind of problem. But when I was spent 11 years in the insurance business, mm. yes. Yeah. And so it's very real in the insurance business. Yeah. You have to put up with shit right. with certain clients because you're like, oh my God, and they always nag and they want everything yeah. like, okay, because the commission yep. and the revenue that yep. comes in, because that's how it is. Yeah. A lot of competition on the other side, someone trying to steal and it. It's and always they, yeah, trying to take your book of business all the time. So you have got to go over and above. And, and it's really like a race to see who can be <laughs> like just, the, just the biggest sap of like, oh, I'll do anything for you. Do you need your car washed? Yeah. I can do that too. Right. I mean, right. that sadly, that was the environment. And then you got to get out of that. But yeah. Yeah. Ahead. Now in the work that I do now, the wonderful thing is, is that I don't have people coming to me that are not my people. Right. Now that hasn't happened. And we, I know we've talked about this. That's really been a, a newer phenomenon in the past six years. And a lot of this has been because of dialing in, using my authentic voice, 
who am I trying to attract? Making sure people know real quick, I'm their guy, or they can determine if I'm their guy or not their guy. There's no mystery, no time wasted. So thankfully, people that are reaching out to me now already know they want to hire me. Like I just got one on Friday. It was great. They said, hey, we want to hire Jared for this. We're located here. Here's the number of people that we have. This is on my contact form. <laughs> I was like, great. They know exactly. You know, it's like, hey, we want Jared to talk to our entire company about how to think about the future, which is one of the core tenets of, of my work. You know, how versus what. And so that's a wonderful thing. I don't have to deal with that problem like I used to. Yeah. Because people that I don't get along with or don't get along with me, we are not going to sign a contract and work together. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. That is a benefit of the position that I'm in now. Yeah. Did they, in that scenario, that scenario, the thing that happened on Friday, they heard about you, or they told about you, did they find your website, they read and listened, and obviously they heard this know. podcast, right? I'm going to find so out. Like, when, yeah. yeah, they probably heard this podcast. Yeah, so like, gosh, those guys were so talented. So and good. then I get on the phone with them. This is what's going to happen. It's my prediction yeah. here. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, we wanted to talk to the other guy. Yeah, yeah. That's what's going to ask you yeah. what say, isn't it? Yeah, that might be it. Hey, who knows, man? So I'll, I'll find out. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, I'll yeah. throw in a good word. Yeah. I'll throw the good word in. Yeah. Content. It works. It does. And you can have like a therapy session. We just spent 30 minutes and you were like on the couch and it's real. And I'm not trying yeah, to make light no, of no. it. No, it's no, good of stuff. Of course. Well, I can't always be an idiot. No, you can't. It's two in a row that you've got pretty know, man. deep. This is deepness. I'm just deepness dealing with some shit, man. Or darkness or both. Darkness is not always bad. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be deep. True. Yeah. Yeah. It took us 17 episodes, 16 episodes. Oh, we're on like just 19 now. farting around. Yeah. Just finding our way. Finally get in. It's like, yeah. It's all of a sudden, now we're going to really start saving the metaverse. Yeah. Yeah. Good transition. That was a terrible transition. Yeah. But thank you. That's yeah. good. You yeah. must think that I'm feeling fragile right now. So you had to compliment a bad transition. I appreciate that. No, but I'm I, not feeling I'm fragile. Just calling to it. It doesn't, because there is no, I, I used to think I had to transition. Like I have these early on, and I would listen to these podcasts I did. And even when it was happening, I was like, oh God, why did I say that? That was right. so dumb. Like I felt the need, everything had to be a transition. Yeah. And what I realized is, is you don't have to transition at all. You I could just transition. ask you a question about military. The next thing I can do is say like, what do you think of Joe Biden's classified documents in his Corvette? I'll right? tell you what I think. I'm I don't saying. give a fuck. I don't care. And I don't think the American people care either. Yeah, and I don't, don't think care. they cared about Trump's classified documents either. Yeah. Why are all the documents classified? Because Hillary got in trouble for this too. There's three like... Apparently this is a pretty normal thing that happens with... But is everything classified that they ever see? I don't know. Like it could be anything. Like <laughs> I have friends we should bring on that could talk about this. I got a buddy. He worked with Defense Intelligence Agency. He's one of the he's one of the sweetest guys you'll ever meet. And I mean, yeah. very. And he's just he's just a great dude all the way around. <laughs> but he could talk about this in a much more intelligent way. Yeah, I'm not looking for intel. I'm just looking for. You, oh, that's right. Facts I'm, don't matter. Thirty here. more minutes I of fun here. Shit. Let's roll. Okay. Yeah. Yes, everything's classified. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I mean, I would say that there's this is there's an abundance of caution in certain things. Mm -hmm. And again, we're speaking in general here, so. Isn't everybody at this point, right? Like, yeah, nobody speaks in specifics. Yeah. I think it's because nobody knows what the fuck is going on. Well, it just kind of sucks because, and we're not picking one side or the other. They're no. all idiots. I heard someone say like, my expectation of what we expect in politics and government officials is like below the floor. Yeah, it's sad. So like, why are we surprised that it's coming out that this is happening? You know, it's kind of annoying. It's like, well, they're still going to prosecute the other guy. They're going after him. It's like, well, now you have to go for everybody. And now it's like, you know what? They're all lost. So you can't really prosecute. Because if you're going to prosecute him, you're probably going to have to impeach Biden. Like, what are we doing here? Right. You know, what would, would be good. Yeah. What I think the American people actually care about is the fact that, and this is bipartisan, elected congressmen and women, senators, these motherfuckers are insider trading all the time. They have enriched uh, themselves yeah. beyond belief yeah. in Washington. That is not a conspiracy of like, oh, I wonder if that's happening. It is a no, documented they it fact. it COVID, yeah. Yes, yeah. it happens all the time. And then, you know, when it was brought up for, gosh, what was it? There was some act that was trying to be passed, they were trying to pass, that would basically say that while you are serving in Congress, you cannot, I think it's you cannot trade, you cannot invest in anything. Like, yeah. you, like your whole oh, activity yeah, yeah. has to stop. Yeah. Nancy Pelosi shut that down. Oh, of course, because she was, weren't they? She, oh, yeah. yeah. But this is Republicans and Democrats. They yeah, all yeah. do it. Oh, God. Like yeah. Richard Burr, our guy here. Yeah. Fucking, like he got crazy rich. Yeah. I think he had put options on um, hotels and cruise liners. I think it was something like that. Oh, he basically geez. was betting against them because he knew it was yeah, coming. You would never because do that. Because he was the head of the, or he's the chairman of the defense committee. 
Defense Intelligence Committee, I believe. I'm gonna probably be messing that up here. See, I can talk like I know what the fuck I'm talking about, and then I mess. We get the idea. Bad. Someone can go right. jump in there. So and, he would know. Yeah, he denies it, of course. And you know what? Hey, maybe it was a coincidence. Right. I don't know, but yeah. it sure does well, look it'd a be little like, sneaky. Oh, I think this vaccine's gonna be a big deal. We're gonna go buy some Moderna stock real yeah. quick. Yeah, yeah. a lot of them did yeah. that too. Yeah. A lot of them did that yeah. too. All that to say is that that actually would be good to see. It's like, hey, look, that's just blatant corruption. Yeah. If you're a citizen, not an elected official, and you get caught for insider trading, how much time do you do in jail? Or what's your fine? Probably not a lot. No, it's a lot. Oh, wait, you're if saying... You, no, no, congressmen are caught insider trading all the time. I'm saying, well, but whatever it's not happened, against the law. Yeah, nothing would ever happen to them, though. Yeah. They're going to avoid it. We're yeah, but if like, you got caught doing insider trading... Oh, yeah, that'd yeah. be bad. Yeah. You'd be up, up the creek, suck. man. Yeah. No, that would you be don't very want to bad. get. I just saw a video. This just happened today's. Yeah, we're recording this on a Monday, so this just happened on a Sunday. An Alabama University of Alabama basketball player, one forty-five in the morning, Sunday morning, got shot someone in a car. Like Whoa. there's gunshots, killed a good. twenty something, twenty like a young woman, uh huh, killed her. They arrested him at like six thirty yesterday evening, and they have video of him. They have video of both. Right. The video, of, I believe, I think it's real, of the ring recording the shooting, right? But you can't see it, but you see people running, you see a car driving, you hear just gunshot after gunshot, yeah. right? They arrest him at 645 that night. Like, that's a quick turnaround to yeah. find somebody. So I'm just talking about, like, going to prison. Yeah. They show this guy walking down the stairs in handcuffs, going to the car, just bawling his eyes and, like, pleading his case and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't want to get arrested for insider trading. No. Which has nothing to do with what the Alabama basketball player is going through right now. You just felt the need to throw a sports analogy in there or a story It's in not there. an analogy. You're right, it's not. It's I just not thought an I'd analog- use a word, a big word, like an I'm analogy. I'm just thinking of, it, like, like I just pictured, what would it be like if you did do that? That would suck. But this guy did shoot. It seems like like you don't arrest someone that quickly, and they called it capital murder. Like there's execution in Alabama. She died. Oh yeah. Oh my god. They pulled up so to. Horrible. I think they pulled up to the campus, and there was two people in the car, and they were complaining that someone in the car had been shot, and she died. Alabama basketball player was a drive by. Mm-hmm. No, I don't know if he was in another car. They were in that car. Oh yeah. They shot into the car. Oh my god. Yeah. Not good. No, it's not good. Capital murder is, that's not good. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound good. <laughs> yeah. Murder does not sound good. No. Murder sounds bad. Yeah. Yeah. So he's off the basketball team. <laughs> this is all because you mentioned, like, if one of us got caught insider trading, it wouldn't be one of us because we're saviors. So that wouldn't happen. Right, if yeah. someone we knew. Yeah. And then they would probably be like, you know. They go to jail. Defecate themselves. It wouldn't be good. No. No. It would not be good. It'd be very bad. Yeah. That's, yeah. But it wouldn't be capital murder. That's different. No, no, not at all. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Do you have a degree in criminal justice? I don't. You're so smart. Yeah. Things. No, I just, I read, <laughs> I read a couple articles. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. Yeah. Then you go to Twitter and they're talking about like, there's just all sorts of comments. Like you never know what you're going to get. Like I got to get off of Twitter. I think I'm going to do it. Like not off of it completely. Like, you know, you stop drinking. Yeah, that's right. Only go there for the things that I want to see, but not <sighs> what like, a novel idea. which I do. For the most part. Yeah. And you get caught up into it. Because yeah. then you read the comments of this guy, this young man, uh-huh. who's obviously very talented in basketball, right? whose career's life possibly over. And you see the comments of what people say, and you're just like, I got to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like someone wanted his sweater because he had like a nice sweater. And they said, you're probably not going to be needing that anymore. Can I oh, have that? <laughs> ridiculous. Well, just That's not even front. funny. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, it's it's, the same we just laughed so at it's it. Like, yeah. We're laughing at the situation because it seems like something you'd see on That's Twitter. We're not laughing at what happened. No, of course not. That's awful. I yeah. don't know. And they said it was a minor altercation. It's like, how does it escalate to that? I don't know, man. That's a whole, that's, that's a, a whole combo. This is like a big mental health. Short for conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. It's good. I was just making sure you're up and up yeah. on the lingo. Yeah. Chat, dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those are like more chats, like more, what's the word? Like, where did chat come from? Chatathon. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, no, good. Yeah. You did really well in word study too. So a yeah. chatathon. Wordle. Yeah, Wordle. Chat-a-thon. Chat-a-thon. So you just talk as long as you can talk. Yeah. What's the world record for longest podcast episode? Do you think we could do it? No. Get this book world records. That's how we get noticed. It's got to be long. I bet they did it for days. But it'd have to be quality. Do you think you'd be able to get breaks? No, it'd be like the filibuster. You okay. can't even leave to pee. No, that's not. That's 100% true. 
like those races like that people do, like David Goggins talks about in his book, yeah. like you have a certain amount of days to finish the race. Yeah, yeah. But a fill, like if you're trying to filibuster something in Congress, you cannot leave the floor to pee or anything. Those are the rules. How long does that take? Is that why they do it so you can get it over with? I think it'd be great if somebody brought pee bottles. <laughs> what if you go to the bathroom? Congress. Like, I don't understand. I don't know, man. This, that doesn't sound real. No, it's true. Look okay. it up. Look at the rules. Do a filibuster. <laughs> Come on, do it now. Yeah. Somebody out there is going to do it. You might as well do it. Mm. Filibuster rules. Filibuster rules. I'm sorry. Type it in. Just type it in. Oh my God. How are your your NFTs doing? (laughs) Yeah, I don't have any. It's not working right now. Yeah, I don't care. I've got Jasper with me. I signed up for Jasper and they haven't stopped emailing me. Oh, they will bombard the shit out of you. It's probably not them. It's Jasper. Jasper. Chad GPT-3. Yeah. It used to be called, it was Iron Man's, Jarvis. Jarvis. Yeah. And they changed Jarvis. the name mm-hmm. because of that, you think? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Probably. Robert Downey Jr. owns it. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't know. It probably could be Marvel. Oh, yeah. Who knows? Who cares? So what do you want to know? Filibuster what? Filibuster rules. Rules for bathroom use? No. Yeah. Why can't I type that? No, just type in filibuster rules. The do's and don'ts of a filibuster. Mm-hmm. Don't overdo it. Do grab a bite to eat. Don't overdo it. No bathroom breaks allowed. Boom. Wow. There you go. Wow. Mystery solved. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was that Mr. Smith goes to Washington? Yeah. Look at you. Didn't yeah, Jimmy man. Stewart is Senator Jefferson Smith uh, in 1939? That's Jimmy Stewart, man. Yeah. That's I, that was a great Jimmy Stewart impression, wasn't it? That was good. Yeah. That's a good movie. Did you remember having to watch that when you were in Dana Elementary Carvey School? does a good Jimmy Stewart impression. Yeah. Yeah. You should watch that. Dana Carvey. He does a lot of yeah. good impressions. Yeah. He's an impressionist. Yeah. 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 So that was good. So yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah. So where are we? Yeah. Let's get a lot yeah, of notes I, over there. I just start writing. Man. Because you have to learn. Like, how do you learn? You just process everything and it just stays in there. Like, I like to write. I recycle information. That's how I learn. Okay. Do recycles actually go to the recycle place or do we like... Actual recycling? Yeah. Ends up in a landfill. It does. You know. Look it up. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have looked it up and no, you're not going to get a straight answer on that. I don't know. You probably will. Here's a good tweet I heard. See, I remember it. This is Twitter. This is why it's useful. And this is a spoiler alert. Oh, geez. God. Watch God. out. So the guy's like, my kids still believe in Santa Claus and mm-hmm. my friends still believe that the recycles still go to the recycling place. <laughs> He's like, we're all living our own universe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, man. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if it does or not. I don't know either. As it deals with being green, it's in the, it's your shirt. Like that's a dark green, but in Damn, dealing man. with green. I saw another tweet. See, this is why it's useful. This is why I do it. This is for our podcast. Yeah. Walkability. Uh-huh. Cities. Yeah. And there's like a big push to have create cities to be more walkable. Even where you live, they're yeah. trying to expand sidewalks. Well, that goes back to the affordable housing problem. Yeah. That, look, that's it, what made it me think of that. It needs to have access to, you know, your basic needs. Yeah. Groceries. Gas. Yeah. I don't know. That's tough though, because Charlotte and a lot of cities are based on... I was in Raleigh this weekend and it seemed to me like it looked great, very clean, but... Like to go from this office park to that one, that would take forever. No <laughs> you, walking, man. Yeah. Uh-uh. No. You bike, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But a lot of cities, like everything is within walking distance to you. Right. I just don't know. I mean, obviously New York City, that's how that was built. Chicago in some some areas, San Francisco. Yeah. But then like San Francisco's falling apart. It's like walking right. dead. It's not good. You saw the video of the guy hosing down one of the homeless people. Like that was awful. No. Yeah. It was bad all the way around. Bad optics for everybody. Because he wouldn't leave. He's trying to get the... And he can't get customers to come to his store. Right. So he's like, take it upon himself and just hose the guy down. Like, it's not good. Yeah, it's probably not the most effective way to deal with it. But apparently no. like, the police aren't doing anything either. Right. So you got all kinds of problems there. And people were like, well, just leave. He's like, well, how can he leave? Like, he's... Whatever your business is, like, it's yeah. just not that easy to pick up and leave. I, I don't know where... Like, it's not good for anybody. Yeah. No. But, but walkability, right? So like, yeah. that's how we got on that. Again, you go in the comments... <laughs> And someone says, I feel sorry for anybody that can't walk. Like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's just like, and then somebody else was like, that's very ableist of you. Yeah. Like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. Like, what are you supposed to do with all that information? Just like, that's why you don't read it. Well, I mean, that's entertaining, but that requires is, a bunch I mean. of extra time, you know, to sift through that. Yeah. You know, to go, oh man, which is not hard. Like if you're on there anyway, you're going to see that and you're probably not reading through thousands of comments. Because oh, a lot of the stuff, what he's saying does make sense. Because I agree. It would, yeah. Like Charlotte, it would be, do well to create more pockets where it's easier to walk. No, that's what people actually want. I mean, that's the thing. We may have covered this in an earlier episode, but 
the vast majority of U.S. cities, major cities, were designed around the car. And we're not designed around people. Yeah. You go over to Europe, they're designed around walking and biking. Right. Because those cities have been there for hundreds, right. thousands of years. Yeah. Right. Thousands no of cars. You no, know, that's a long time. But I mean, you've got. But no, I agree. Cause like you look at a city like Charleston, which yeah. is a few hundred years old, like yeah. it's older, but right, like where things were actually developed. Yeah. It makes sense that anywhere in, in that area, you can walk. But then when you want to go out to other places, yeah. you're not walking. Not happening. I mean, it's crazy that I have to drive from my neighborhood to this office. You could bike. I could. It'd be dangerous on some roads over there because, yeah. Not for me, man. You might not I know make how it. to handle traffic. Yeah, I know you do. We've talked about that too much, but... I know. It Let's is crazy. Yeah. You could... How many miles is it? Three, four miles, you think? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. That's not much. Not even. No, you just go straight. That'd be like probably less than that. I guess I could Keep just... talk talking. I could just look. Yeah, look it up, man. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. So what were you saying? I would say it's probably... Here, I'll look it up, man. I don't want to be blasting my home address I'm on this podcast. I'm not going to put your address in there. Shh. No one's going to see it. Look, man, we're going to get down to the bottom of this right okay. now. Okay. Mm. Here we go. Yeah. So, jeez. If we're going from this, where's my maps? I'm just trying to let you catch up here. I really appreciate that. Yeah. You could just put in the name of the school if you want. I mean, it's kind of like... The school's still a little ways away. I mean, it's not that far. Here we go. Oh, I got to download Google Maps. AI would have told us the answer already. I know. I mean, dude, it's like really close. Right. Go ahead. Put my address in. It's one, the two, school. three. Awesome street. Yeah. <laughs> it's one mile to the school. From here? To the school. Oh, yeah. So it's probably just 1.5 miles to, yeah. to the neighborhood. Well, general would be good. Like, yeah, again, it's, we're it's not, not looking for exact. Yeah. 1.72 miles. I like sir. operating generalities. Yeah. Exacts or, yeah. you know. So I think you should walk here. I could. Because then you're helping and you drop your cycles off on the way over here. Do they have a recycling center out here? Uh, the, I did find they have one, Davy Park. Yeah, yeah. They have one at the park near me. It's an amazing very, place. Oh, you were there by the Park Road? Such, hey. Oh, yeah, man. Hey. And I used to have to drive that far. We're in the metaverse. Like, I'm wherever I need to be. That's right. Yeah. You're here and there. Yeah. All at the same time. Yeah. No, no, that's the multiverse. Damn it. We keep getting that one confused. <laughs> should probably mm. get that right. Yeah. yeah. We'll work Ele- on that one birds. Yeah. 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 It's really good. Yeah. Hey, you know, something on another note that was really exciting is you said that we got a uh, copyright infringement notice because no, of Rebecca Black. It wasn't an infringement. It was just like a notice, like, hey, we noticed. Yeah. It's okay, because nobody owns a copyright, but just know we're watching. Something to that effect. Right? You want some dead is. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. You just totally forgot we were being filmed. No, so, I know we're being filmed. Oh, okay. But Julian's going to make sure that that wasn't on no, he's the video. Not. I hope that he zooms in really close. No, he better not. He better. No. Yeah. Zoom in really close mm-hmm. and amplify the sound. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. Let's not do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is the tis the season to be blowing your nose. Definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of... I would like to just say I do appreciate your vulnerability <laughs> in blowing your nose during the podcast. A lot of people wouldn't do that. It says something about our relationship. It does. And it says something about just your willingness to, to be you. Be who I am. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I'm going to move this. Like, You've get gone my ears. from being super self-conscious oh, on podcasts so like bad. about what you say, how you're delivering it, even mid-show, to yeah. now you're just pulling out tissue and yeah. letting it rip. <laughs> yeah. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. I think you've made a... Progress. Yeah. You've made a lot of no, progress. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Keep going. No, 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 no. It's good. Yeah. I like it when we can kind of just, you know, complete each other's sentences like wow. that. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Friendships are formed in the metaverse on a podcast. I do think at some point we're going to just have to drop the whole metaverse thing because we never fucking talk about it. Yeah, we do. We've talked about it multiple times a day. Intentionally because we feel obligated because it's the name of our podcast. And you know yeah. what? I'm okay with that. Buying real estate in the metaverse. What does yeah. that make you think about? Stupid investment. <laughs> what if you're right? I don't know, man. How did it go? I was like, how did it go? From me? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It, it was everything, right? Yeah. Could Gary V be wrong on this one? Because he was, he's still all in on it. Right. And I'm not saying he's, I don't know. Like there's NFTs, like the art of NFT and mm-hmm. like the actual trade of like a ticket. I do believe like tickets could be the utility behind what's behind yeah. an NFT. I think the name should go away. I think that's confusing to people. Like utility matters. What do I get? Right. Like, what am I actually, what am I receiving matters? It's like an agreement with you're going to have with your new client. Right. We want you to do this. I'm going to do that. You get it. It makes sense. And it's right here. And if I don't provide these things and you get your money back. Yeah. So I think there's definite utility in all that. It's just a lot because it's, it's confusing. Like goggle, Oculus goggles and you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Let's find out here. Yeah. Average time people spend in VR. Not a lot. 
a day, like the person who has one. Right. So Oculus users, let's just look at that. How long do people spend in virtual reality? I mean, they'll give us some answer. Yeah. Average session time of VR users in the US is 2019. Is that fair? That's mm-hmm. too long ago. Oh, geez. Statista. You use that website. Do you like that? No. Allow your cookies. So now they're hacked in. Get some cookies. Yes, God. Yeah. What is 19.7 mean? 19.7 what? Minutes. Okay. All users, first time users, 16, returning users, 20.4. Like, okay. Congratulations. Okay, so. That was three years ago, though. So it's got to be higher, right? Or, maybe or it's people it? are like, this sucks. VR headsets only say six hours of usage a month on average. Okay. That's a month per user. So, so that's the first thing that I would look at. Yeah. How much time are people actually spending in the metaverse? That's 2019, too. Like, what do we, it's, that's pre COVID. Yeah, man. Such a, I, I know how to do this stuff. Yeah. I know. But we're, we're working in real time here. That's right. Yeah. Past year. We'll do that. Is that fair? Yeah. People expect to spend less than four hours a day in the metaverse. Oh, so oh no. People expect to spend at least four hours a day in the metaverse. Okay. When? Who's saying that? Like a Gen Z, at... millennials, Gen X consumers. No, that's not I, right. Yeah, yeah. That's just people expect to do that. I mean, sure. You think, oh, great. We can live in the metaverse. But I own a headset. You own a headset. I turn them personally when my kids does. And I kick a chair. My man. Yeah. In my shin. Oh, yeah. That's Because right. the guy you... was shooting at me. Oh. Which game are you playing? I don't know. But it was like slow motion. He raises his gun and he shoots and you see the bullet coming at you and you're like, fuck. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of videos on that. Yeah. People go through a wall. It's dangerous stuff. Yeah. $15.8 billion industry in 2020. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. But average usage. Average what time spent. Okay. Annual revenue by 2024. VR markets will trip. Yeah, these are all like projections. Oh, they'll triple this. They'll do this. They'll do that. VR no, gaming. Just... I just want to know time. Expected to become mainstream in the next three to four years. You buy that? No. The interface, you know, the goggles, all those things have to become, it has to become so integrated. So easy. It's like an iPhone. It's like you just pull it out and it's super easy. Yeah. Have you not found the no, average time people spend? I'm sorry. There's a bunch of 50% of you have found the experience to be extremely or moderately satisfying. 2022. Okay, here we go. It's 2023. But what is this? We crap? just started. Insider Intelligence. I want to find this out and it says access all charts and data, become a client. <laughs> no, it's not worth that. What, okay. Gardner predicts 25% of people will spend at least one hour a day in the metaverse. That's Work, a prediction. Shopping, education, social, and or entertainment. Let's see here. This is still 20. So you want to change the name of the podcast is what you're telling me. No. We're talking about whether or not the metaverse is going to really take off, take off. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of this is going to be, you know, predictions, which again, I'll I know. say, you know, are hit and miss all the time. Yeah. That's coming from a futurist. So take that mm. one to the bank. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. I think it really just comes down to how much time people actually spend. Once the devices become so cheap and their utility becomes so well-defined and adopted, sure, you're going to see increases at that point. Mm-hmm. But where we are right now, I mean, if I use one, I'm using it for like thrill of the fight, that boxing game. That is a hell of a workout. I'll lose like three pounds of water weight in nine rounds. Really? It's amazing. You know? Okay. I'm like, man, this is, a, this is great. What this are you punching a- there? Yeah. I mean, you're not punching an actual yeah, person. You can't you're punching. You. No, you're I don't. <laughs> Come here, kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just punch dancing. Yeah. If yeah. you've not played the game, punch dance is yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a good workout. Okay. Because your brain can't tell the difference between... Are you dizzy after? No. I mean, uh, I'm winded, but I'm not dizzy. Not dizzy from your, like, working out. Like, dizzy because you're, you know, like people say, you get get a headache. No, not from that. Nauseous. Yeah. If you've got games that, like, accelerate you forward and, you know, going over long distances, yeah, that'll mess you up. Because I've messed around with some of those. And honestly, like, the gaming in VR to me is like, uh, I'm just not really interested. That requires time. But I'm also not really interested in... Like I might play some video games for like 20 minutes. I'm like, oh, it's yeah. fun to just let my brain unwind for a little bit. Right. But I'm like, God, I can't imagine spending four hours on this. Yeah. Like I just don't, I don't have the patience. Yeah. It's the same thing with VR. Yeah. So. But you're a Gen X seal, right? Is that what it is? Xennial. Xennial. Yeah. That's right. So anyway, all that said, when it comes down to the metaverse, the answer is, I don't know. We should probably do a little bit more speculation on this. Yeah. I need to really look into a few more actual data, not Gardner projects. Yeah. Gardner does good work, but you can project stuff all day long. I always like to look at human behavior. You know, how are they utilizing it now? How accessible is it? And is there a function right now that it is serving that is 
significantly better, mm-hmm. you know, than what you have to do in the real world. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. Because we could do this podcast. You don't have to walk or drive here. Right. And we could, we could be in the same room together. Yeah. You're holding hands. Right. Bring it in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's where they're going, right? That's where Zucks is going. Well, I can't talk about what Zach is going to do. I yeah. can't. But he's he's um, all in on the metaverse, right? Or is he is that a just called his company Meta? What do you What do you think? I think so. I think so too. Yeah, he's all in. Yeah, but that's all I can say. Okay, but that's we all could have gotten that. Yeah, as you see, I'm abiding by our NDA <laughs> for now. Still waiting on that loan. Oh, so you're that family member that just Zuck is not my family by blood. Okay. Uh-huh. Not by marriage either. <laughs> by NFT though, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's another great utility. Yeah. Do his kids use Oculus? Can't talk about that. I think they do. Not Instagram. They've got security guards in the metaverse. Yeah. It's pretty intense. Yeah. What social media app? If you had you had to use one every day. Every day. What'd you use? Pinterest. <laughs> okay. Why Pinterest? I just feel good when I go to Pinterest. Just really simple and hasn't changed for 10 years. Yeah. It's clean. Pictures. It's clean. They're not trying to yeah. sell me anything. Maybe yeah. they are sometimes. I don't go there very often. Yeah. And, you know, you got boards. I'm like, these are great. Mm. You know, it's not like, oh, I want to see some stuff on this. And then advertisers sneak in a bunch of shit you don't want to see because they paid for that access. Mm. Could you sell your business on Pinterest? Never tried. Maybe I should. You should. We should do that. You should delete all of your other stuff, right? No, I'm going to get off Twitter, but not totally off Twitter. Yeah. But like, but it's just so much fun in there sometimes. <laughs> hey man, you know, no shame in that. What is it? What, yeah, like your uh, guilty pleasure. Was that a guilty pleasure? What's my guilty pleasure? Yeah. If you want to answer that. Porn. No. <laughs> <I'm just> gonna... <laughs> if you would have said Pinterest, that would have been better. <laughs> Everything's Pinterest. No, no, no. Yeah. Just kidding. It's just yeah. That would be the most obnoxious thing to say. Yeah. Oh, guilty pleasure. Mm. Yeah. I didn't ask you. You asked yourself. Oh, I did? Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Quora. You go on Quora? You answer some questions? I did once or twice. I would. I answered some questions. But then I was like, God, I just don't care. Because the interface <laughs> sucks. It really comes down to like how yeah. pretty is the interface. Yeah. You know? Reddit? No. It's like the biggest message board in the world. Oh, I know. It's insane. Yeah, I just don't care. And you don't know who you're arguing against. Did you say there's like the bots arguing with one another? And yeah, Reddit there's a whole Reddit thread, Twitter Jeez. bots arguing with each other over politics and other stuff. Oh, it's pretty ugly. God, yeah. Yeah. It's not good. What's your guilty pleasure? No, I said Twitter comments. Oh. I don't know if that's it or not. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, you're not that interesting, so that makes sense. It is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right. We'll keep it there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. This is really good. This is good. Yeah, man. When's that sun going to come back out? Come on. You going to complain about that? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. I am thankful that it's not raining today. There you go. Gratitude. Gratitude. It, it does. I heard you supposed to like not only be grateful. It's not about being grateful. Mm-hmm. It's about thinking about a time when someone, it could have been you or it could have been someone else, showed gratitude. Yeah. So you know that time you came off, it's like, Eric, I just want to thank you. Mm. And you went deep into it. You just felt it. And you're like, I could just think of that time. Yeah. That's gratitude. That's practicing gratitude. It's yeah. not always like, well, I'm grateful that I have this pen to write on this paper and I have right. this iPad and I have a friend here. There it is. It's actually about thinking of a moment. Like you could have been at a restaurant and you saw a thankful person say something. Like thinking of that moment and putting yourself in that place, that's practicing gratitude. Yes. Theoretically. No, I mean, I'm just kidding. Yeah. It's like, know. why? Why? Why argue with what you just said? Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Wow. I know. You usually do. That's my love language, conflict. So I'm just trying to pick a fight. That's vulnerability. Yeah. I like, like that. that. That's good. Yeah. Do you get nervous when you come in here and you're about to be recorded? Nope. That's good. Clearly. Yeah. I know. I've accepted all of my downfalls. <laughs> yeah. Do you get nervous? No, I don't. I was just wondering. Oh, okay. Have you, I thought of it because you said vulnerability and there's this person I was talking to and I could tell when you, before I talked to him, I think I was, had some nerves yeah. and I'd mentioned it to him and he's just like, man, that's so cool that you said that. Yeah. That was, you guys recorded that? It was just live. I didn't rehearse it. Was this person important? I don't know. I mean, yeah, to some people. Was this me? Did you no, say this to no, me? No, I didn't. No, oh, because it sounds like something you said. Should I have you on the podcast? You should. I think I just did today. The first 30 minutes was the Jared show. It really was the Jared yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah, it was really good. We could change the name. No. Nah. Would you do that? Or is that? No. Nah. Sorry. It's too much work on my part. Because then I have like, a, you know, reputation to uphold. 
I don't know, man. I just don't think I could do that. Do you play fantasy football? I do not. Do you know anything about it? Nope. Like sports gambling? Like, do you pay attention to that stuff? Like, cause you, you not no, at all. Nothing. Nope. I'm pretty no. lame. I pay attention to the Browns. No, it's okay. Yeah. I'm saying it because of like, it's a lot of people pay attention to one of those two things. And that's why they like football. Yeah. Because it's, it's more the addiction to what that thing is right. that hooks them to whatever they need. Right. So right. If like you're hooked, I don't know if this is it right, but like if you're hooked up, we talked about this before. If you like smoking, you might go to the bar and drink a beer. And every time you get the bar, you smoke a cigarette. Yeah. But anyways, so it's like, this is not that good, but it's okay. Keep going. But you are not addicted to that, but you still enjoy the Browns. But people will like be all in on NFL because yeah. they like to gamble and they like fantasy football. Right. It's interesting. Because you have, it's something too, what's mm -hmm. different in this, like a cigarette, you can light it up. So oh, it's an addiction. You have no control. I mean, you have like a little bit of control. You could do research, you can study data. Yeah. And then you're making a decision based on real things. I would imagine they're supposed to be real things playing out in real time mm -hmm. that decide one way or the other. Yeah. How it plays it's because up. you're a participant rather than just a passive observer. You're an active participant in something yeah. that requires that you understand what's going on with the NFL yeah. so that you can participate in this other thing, your fantasy football league. Yeah. That's what it is. So you give more people opportunities to participate in something, you know, like fantasy football. And you can apply this to anything. You can create a game, the whole idea about gamification. Yeah. Most of the time it's been like, oh, somebody gets a badge for completing. No, no. Fantasy football is gamification. Yeah. It's drawn in a whole new audience of people because of, Crazy. you know, I mean, the gambling aspect, sure. Yeah. But it's more so just the competition. We love competition. People do. Yeah. Competition is fun. It's just in our nature. It's amazing what they've done. That's why people watch. I bet if I were to get into fantasy football, I'd really get into it. Yeah. And I just don't have the bandwidth. Yeah. No, that's bullshit. I do have the bandwidth. I'm afraid to you surrender. You interest. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to look for more stats. And the stats, just the way they even share it. Six billion dollar industry in 2021. Maybe. Ask chat GPT. Yo. I think a chat GTP is open today. That's a problem. I don't know. I saw, this is great. I saw on Twitter. Yeah. The guy laid off his workforce. Yeah. And he just does chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> is that real? How many people I do mean, you have? What do you want to ask chat GPT? Ask the average time spent in virtual reality headsets. Thinking. 2022. It's just thinking. Ooh. It's a hobby. I'm talking about fantasy football right now. Oh. Then we'll go back to yours. Okay. Thank you. 41 million people play it. That mm -hmm. was in 2019. Yeah. It's valued at around $7 billion. $7 billion market. And so what do you want to know about? How many, what? In 2022, what was the average... ChatGPT doesn't go to 2022. Do you know that? Oh, 21. yeah, they only go to 21. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's look at 21. Okay. It's a better way to phrase that question. I'll figure it out. It's yeah, ChatGPT. Well, it's ChatGPT. Smart. Yeah. yeah. No one's listening anyway at this point. No. Yeah. This is great. I'm sorry. I do not have information. Oh, I can tell you the average time spent in VR depends on the VR. Depends on the what? The user. Like, really? See, that's the, okay, remember we talked about last yeah. time when I said yeah. there are certain articles that you can tell were written by using a program like OpenAI or ChatGPT. It's because you're looking for like the top five best, I think we talked about podcasting headphones, right. which I don't even know is a real thing. You know, CES will tell you, these are the top five. We tested them all. Here's why, you know, ChatGPT will say, Here's the top five, but then you're going to have all this information first. Let's talk about the yeah. importance of this. Let's talk about that. And when they get down to the next five or the top five, they're just giving you the features. They're telling right. you what, what it's about. They can't really say, it can't really say, right. here's what I tested. Yeah. Now, as soon as chat GPT can actually test products, then everybody's fucked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, chat GPT is testing products. Well, what if they give you a recommendation right. for a product? Based on what? You use the product. Mm -hmm. They send you a prompt. Hey, Jared, you use those headphones. How did you like them? And you say this, that, and the other. Yeah. Then they do that a million times over. And so that I go in there and say, what should I use? And now they have all this data yeah. to suggest this is real data that you should buy yeah, these headphones. It's no different than just like, you know, five-star reviews on Amazon. I know, but you have to read through it. Now it's just being, I don't have to read. Think okay, about Okay, do you remember one of our first episodes? We talked about this, about technology. And the thing that is missing, the whole issue of trust. Trust is the thing that really moves the needle. Yeah. Why it won't replace the human interaction side of things. So GPT can, of course, do that and pull data. But again, what you're getting is, is you're just getting data. What I want to know as a human being is, 
Did a trusted source actually test this shit out? And can they give me a nuanced answer based on, hey, this is the criteria we used to judge these. You can get a million people reviewing something, but that's a million people. And all you're doing is taking the average. What I want to know is, hey, this guy, gal, or this small team of people, they're excellent. They understand this industry. They understand what quality is. Because a lot of reviews over shitty products are because they're super cheap, but they don't know what quality is. So what they've got, they're like, hey, this is their baseline. Like These things work great. But if you know what quality is because you have experience with a certain type of product, you might use it and go, this thing is garbage. You get what you pay for. Right. So that's not very helpful. Yeah. See? Yeah. You got to have trust. And I guarantee you nobody's going to trust GPT-3. I agree. Nobody trusts it now. Yeah. But we don't trust technology anyway. Yeah. You know? Except the metaverse. Nope. So like, yeah, totally. there's three letters. GPT. Mm-hmm. And a number. NFT. No. Well, G- and then GPT-4 is coming up. Of course. And that's going to be badass. Yeah. That's going to change it. That's what I'm in. Yeah. Who would want? Who do you pick? GPT? Just the regular one. Just like... The base model? Low- yeah. Versus NFT. Like, you got to pick one that's going to be the future. You're a futurist. Oh, GPT. Okay. By far. Okay. Because, I mean, that immediately addresses a need. That's a need on a mass scale, right? And I say need, or it's more of a, it immediately becomes a tool that everybody can use because you have to be able to communicate. Even if you're a shitty communicator, you still have to do it. Yeah. So now you've got an accessible tool that can help you do that. Yeah. NFTs, people are like, oh, I got to spend a lot of brain power just trying to figure out what the fuck this thing is. Yeah. It's going to take a while. Yeah. Take a long while. Yeah. GPT. Yeah. I like it might it. hit me with more. You ready for this one? Sure. This is all for you because I'm not, I'm not there. I don't Great. know. It's Monday. Yeah. I asked chat GPT-3, our buddy. We're hosting a podcast right now. <laughs> That's why you were talking. And we talk about many topics. Give us a topic we should discuss that would be both funny and interesting. Yeah. One topic that could be both funny and interesting for your podcast is... And then it gave us, you could explore some of the most bizarre and usual or just... Holy shit, that's yeah. great. <laughs> Julian, cut that part out because we need to do that. Yeah. That's oh, really can, good. That is good. Fuck. Well, that, that's your podcast. What do, you, mm. what do you talk about? We ask GPT and it tells us. We're going to have GPT give us like, yeah. all of a sudden yeah. our, our freestyle, unprepared podcast, like we always do it. Yeah. That's going to change. I heard, I think. Yeah, that was good. That was good. That was really good. So, uh, Reed Hoffman, maybe? He's going to do a podcast with a chat GPT and somehow they're going to have the voice. They have some other technology yeah. that's going to be the voice. So his podcast co-host will be mm-hmm. chat GPT in the voice of whoever. Sean Connery. Yeah. Oh, That'd course. be good. That would be good. They're really good. Yeah. Young Sean Connery. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, you got to get really specific. Like The Rock? Or are you going back to James Bond, Sean Connery? The Rock? Like the movie. Oh, the, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 About Alcatraz. I mean, like yeah. Dwayne Johnson's like, what? No. <laughs> yeah. So if let's say you did that, okay. doesn't Sean Connery's estate want a piece of that? See, this is the really interesting thing when it comes to voice, when it comes to deep fakes, yeah. right? You know, I mean, right now, several movies have been made using advanced CGI. I mean, there's, you know, Unreal Engine that yeah. looks so realistic that you can take actors and their likeness and you can make them 30 years younger, 20 years younger, back to when they first got started. I can't remember some of the movies they've done this with. With the Star Wars, I think Rogue One did this. You can still kind of tell, like, oh, that's that's CGI. Mm. But they, you know, so they can line up the timeline with, you know, the first Star Wars movie that came out of New Hope. And so it's really interesting. So they can match, you know, they're not having to throw a different actor in there. Yeah. But that's where the, you know, what do you own? Do you own your likeness? I mean, you do. So being able to monetize your voice, your face, over and over. I mean, think about this for actors. I mean, I think about like Trump, right? Trump has done a really good job of monetizing the Trump brand. I think, I can't remember where this was, but like the vast majority of Trump properties are not owned by Donald Trump. He just leases the name. Mm-hmm. He basically says, look, yeah, you can use the name. Wow, I know that. And he makes money off that. Wow. He's smart like that. Not on everything but he's really smart on leveraging brand. Yeah. So if you can leverage your face, your voice, whatever it might be, that asset, then you have the opportunity to, to make real money. Yeah. Potentially. But that also might be limited to the few that are recognizable. Yeah. So like in that scenario, if you want to have a podcast with Donald Trump's voice, it's mm-hmm. not him. 
Right. It's just more his voice and AI's maybe speaking his voice because they have enough speeches out there to like pull that off of. And it sounds like you're actually talking to him a little bit. I guess mm-hmm. most people will figure out it's not really him, but you're using his brand. Yeah. Do you have to write him a check? Does he have to okay that? You know, my initial thought would be like, he should absolutely get paid. That's anybody, whether it's right. him or anybody I, else. Yeah. If you're using maybe not you, their but... voice and the machine is replicating that voice, then that's copyright infringement. Yeah. Yeah. What if it's not exact? It's just a little bit off. Yeah, I guess it would come down to, you know, if it's a parody, then you can get away with it. Mm. If it's just a little bit, you could probably get away with it. But again, that's why we have lawyers, right? So yeah. they can just fuck everything up. Yeah. Make it. But in that scenario, you would think like the AI lawyers which should be the ones arguing that one, not like the real life. Now lawyers. we're getting deep with it. Yeah. Now you've got bots that have legal degrees that they didn't go to school for. They just flipped a switch and now they downloaded they a badge. all the legal knowledge they ever needed. Yeah. They got the Twitter blue badge. So yeah. Gonna, I got it. Oh, did you? Yeah. Of course you did. See? Yeah, it makes sense to me that you got that. But think about this. Chat GPT is down a lot. Like if they were to said, hey, give us 10 bucks a month. Yeah. We want access. But now they're cutting out how many millions of people would stop using it. Mm -hmm. And I get it. They want more people to use it right now. Like that's probably part of the process. So it's like when you're on Twitter, if someone's not willing to spend a few bucks and they get mad about it, like maybe that's a way to cut out people from doing it. Is it eight bucks a month or just eight? Eight bucks a month. Some stupid. I yeah. mean, and it gives you, it gives some perks of like whatever, but I don't know. Yeah. And I mean, in the blue check, it just shows that, and I'm not saying it shows anything. Like I'm not suggesting if someone doesn't have it, like, I'm sorry, I will not speak to you anymore. Right. But it makes you suspect to, as to whether or not they're a real person or a bot. Yeah. I mean, I went on a unfollower stats, you just to see it. Mm-hmm. And it's like three bucks. Yeah. You just to look and you see all the people that were following you that are not following you anymore. Yeah. Because Twitter got rid of them. Yeah. They're deleted users. So they're off. That means they were bots. Yeah. Here, my favorite on Twitter or any social media platform, they'll go follow a thousand people. Right. They'll get 400 people follow back and then they'll unfollow everybody. Oh, yeah. So they have 400 followers. They don't follow anybody. And then what Twitter's been doing a lot, and they've been doing this for a little bit, they're doing it more, is they'll suspend that account, which they should. If they do a follow, because it's follow. just, yeah, yeah but like, jerk but in a scammy way. It's like, for what? And that was the Instagram model. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Follow, unfollow. Yeah. It's like, this just seems shitty. You have like a 500 followers or thousands of followers from other countries. Yeah. Like, and then you just go through, it's like, no, it's fake. Yep. Fake news, fake engagement. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's really good. So chat GPT will tell us what to talk about in the future. Wow. That's really impressive. Yeah. They just pulled that out of their ass. That yeah. That's pretty good. That was a really good idea. Yeah. I think we should shut this podcast down and just start working on some ideas. Let's do it. All right. Yeah, buddy. It's been good. It's fun. I thought, yeah, it's great. I almost said <laughs> you I can love even you. Sign off properly. Yeah. I'd just like to sign off right now. I love you. That's it. Well, yeah. Like family. Yeah. 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 Because we signed it in the NFT. Mm, utility. Okay. Yep. Perfect. I'll see you later. Peace out.